This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Our collective behaviors could shift very subtly, yet result in far-reaching changes. The more we understand our own filters, the more we will respond with compassion rather than vindictiveness, the more we will be authentic rather than guarded, and the more we will persist in our inner struggle for the world we want to experience. When we decide to acknowledge and heal our inner reactivity, we put ourselves on a trajectory where useful opportunities may be more likely to happen to us. These are called synchronicities, and they serve to help us grow into the people we become. They are not positive, but self-reinforcing reflections of who we are. Valeria Telles interviews Sky Nelson Isaacs on the book, Leap to Wholeness, How the World is Programmed to Help Us Grow, Heal, and Adapt. Sky Nelson Isaacs is a theoretical physicist, speaker, author, and musician, He has a master's degree in physics from San Francisco State University with a thesis in string theory and a BS in physics from UC Berkeley. Nelson Isaacs has dedicated his life to finding his own sense of purpose, beginning as a student of the yogic master Sri Swami Satchidananda when he was less than five years old. His writing on topics like flow comes from integrating this experience into his life. He brings together the connection between synchronicity physics, and real life using research and original ideas. An educator with nine years of classroom experience, Nelson Isaacs is also a multi-instrumentalist and professional performer of award-winning original musical compositions. Meet Sky at synchronicityinstitution.com and skynelson.com. Here's the interview with Sky Nelson Isaacs. In your own words, who is Sky Nelson Isaacs? I am a quester, a scientist, and also someone who has had a lot of spiritual experiences and reading and training. And I seek to connect the dots between the events that I experience in my life and the learning that I want to experience in my inner life. So the outer and the inner are part of one consistent experience that uh, I think comes together with this notion of synchronicity or meaningful coincidences. And these meaningful coincidences take us on a path of learning and growth and healing. The first question, the second official question is, how do you define spirituality these days? Spirituality for me has always been a question of what is space and time? What is the cosmos that we live in? And who am I in that space and time? So while I've had experiences of personal uh, transcending awareness at times in my life, like seeing things from a bigger context, which is one definition of spirituality, seeing the bigger context in life. I've also had a training in science and a background in you know, scientific reasoning and logic. And, and I think it's very important to, to connect the dots between our uh, spiritual experiences and our left-brained reasoning of the world that that is so powerful as well. Some people, they call it a balance. Is that the understanding you have of balance, of harmony? Yes, I think uh, balance is a very important aspect of how, how I've tried to grow in my life. Uh, I, I, I'm also a musician, so I, I bring a whole uh, element, different set of qualities of my experience into my music that I do into my research. And when I'm publishing academic stuff, it's a different set of skills, different different aspects of myself. And that has led me to this experience of wholeness that I haven't 
decided to go just one direction, but to embrace these multiple aspects of who I am. Because when I when I let go of any one thing completely, if I just let go of music in my life, I don't feel whole and I feel the loss. And I think each of us has so many aspects to who we are. And what what's what can tend to happen is we let go of certain aspects. We say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to let go of my creativity. I'm going to let go of my uh, I don't, I'm not a math person, so I'm going to just let go of that. But we all have different aspects of ourselves that can come together into creating who we are as a whole. And the more we can embrace all of that without rejecting any part of ourselves, the more we experience wholeness and this, ex this sense of flow in life where we let go of control, but we also are the, the, the directors of our narrative in life. It's a paradox in a way, isn't it? This idea of searching for wholeness and being wholeness. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks about this paradox in a really useful way. He says, you know, our sense of flow is uh, often we think about like trying to either, should I take control of the situation? You know, I'm at work and somebody makes a mistake. Should I like come down really strictly and make a take control? Or should I let go and be, be, resi be, um, in f like surrender, like leave it up to circumstances. And Csikszentmihalyi says that what we really need to do or to get into the flow is to, to recognize that we're worried about control. We spend our adult lives being worried about whether we should be in control or not. And when we can let go of that worry, we actually get to a space of really dynamically relating to our circumstances in the moment. And there's more vulnerability, there's more receptivity, there's more accepting and ad adapt adapting to circumstances in our lives. And then also more proactivity in that as well. Talk to me for a moment, Sky, about the idea of free will. Like you talk from that perspective that we can do something. But I'm wondering if there is um, another perspective, which is this open awareness that I'm not sure if that's those words are correct, uh, can be applied. But this idea that we are choosing or becoming aware of what is available, really. It's not really a choice that we are making, we're just becoming aware of the, uh, the possibilities. It, this is not coming from an individual, but from life itself operating. Right, that, that's really the key idea of why synchronicity is such an important part of flow. Because to be in flow, we have to be ready for the unexpected situations in life. You know, synchronicities are unexpected situations or circumstances that actually lead to some kind of positive experience we're seeking to have. And it might not be a positive experience in our direct understanding. You know, I, I've, I could say that um, I've had experiences of illness or I've talked to people who have had experiences of getting fired from a job. These are experiences they don't want to repeat. And yet they've learned really critical um, life experiences of, that make them more connected to other people in their lives, more um, open to and more courageous, more more trusting of life through yeah. those difficult experiences. So there is something that learns, right? If we can call, and then the point of view here is the person, it's somebody, this um, individualized wholeness, which is a very interesting idea that everything's whole in a way. It seems to be separated, but it's not. It's also whole uh, appearing as separated. Well, the title of my book captures that for me, which is Leap to Wholeness, that we're making a leap from um, understanding you know, who we, who we want to be and understanding maybe who we think we should be, and then taking a leap to actually being that person that, that we want to be and embodying it. And there's a sense of, of trust and um, surrender in that leap. That's where the flow comes in and being open to synchronicity. Like we can't control the circumstances. And so we immerse ourselves more deeply in them and then the subtitle of the book also is, you know, I think really helpful here because it's how the world is programmed, like via the synchronicities that happen to us, how the world is programmed to help us heal, grow, and adapt. So the, the point of synchronicity is not to like make your life rich or better or get you, give, you, give you the things you want, but to help you on a journey of healing and growth so that we can live more fulfilling lives, but also um, be more whole in who we become. If we are coming from that idea of separation, right, that we are not whole already, which is um, fascinating to me that we can even talk about this, <laughs> not being whole, but whole at the same time. So, yeah, you wrote the book, Leap to Wholeness, how the world is programmed to help us grow, heal and adapt. Talk to me for a moment about the main inspiration and the intention of writing your book. 
Well, you talked about this idea of separation. And yeah. in science, there's this underlying um, assumption that I think most scientists operate from that's called reductionism, which is this idea that you can break everything down into its parts. And from those parts, you can understand the whole thing. And this is extremely effective. Chemistry is a study of how all matter can be broken down into atoms. And those atoms or chemicals we have in a periodic table. And it's extremely predictive. It tells us exactly how these chemicals will behave. So this is not wrong, but it there is a complementary view, which also has properties that are not captured by the reductionist view. And this is what we call holism. And my inspiration is actually discovering this holism in the, the formalism of quantum mechanics and, and fundamental physics in ways that are actually known to, to physicists, but not really understood in this greater context of, of what wholeness really means, what holism really means. Um, so the idea that we're separated seems to be obvious, like we all live in different places and we, if we want to be connected, we have to really work hard at being connected. But there's this, the, the research that I've done uh, is based around this, this beautiful mathematical property of um, space and time, which is the Fourier transform, which is a lot of people are familiar with because it's so fundamental to math and physics. But why it's important to just everyone to understand is that it's the way that we we recontextualize a physical object in terms of frequencies. And this is where the idea of frequencies becomes really, really relevant. Um, let me be specific, like if you have music, everyone's familiar with music, like you have a five minute song that you're gonna listen to. Well, you're also familiar with the fact that you can change the equalization on that music. You can turn a dial and you can increase the high frequencies or decrease the high frequencies. Well, the way that works is by converting the music from time into frequency, and then adjusting the frequencies, and then converting it back to time. And you have a different file now, a different piece of music, which is still the same length, it still has the same basic journey through the song, but the quality of the music is different. So what this points to is, when specifically when we talk about this frequency representation, it's th there's a wholeness to it. When I make a change to the frequencies, I change the song as a whole. The entire song changes its quality. I, and this is a sense in which the, the, this time, explicit time specifically, is not reductionist. It is holistic. And so my work, uh, and I have a paper that was published this past year in a quantum reports journal, um, talks about how this wholeness of time and space itself is fundamental to our understanding of light and fundamental to our understanding of the universe in general. And from this, it's possible to think about synchronicity as a real phenomenon that can be studied from a scientific lens, as a synchronicity being a falling together in time, two events that line up in time. And let, let me give a brief example yeah, yeah. of what the synchronicity is so people can understand. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I have, I, I, I keep these examples fresh in my mind because, um, for me, it's not just a one-time thing. I had one great synchronicity once in my life and wrote it down. And it's actually something that happens to me every day and to a degree. Like, how do I align with the circumstances in my life? So, um, you know, one simple example is a friend of mine who was looking for information about a ring that she was wearing. She had a stone on her finger that she forgot the, the name of the stone. So she, after some weeks of just thinking about it, she wrote to her jeweler and sent a picture of the stone. But that same day, she also went to the, the hair salon and got her hair cut. And uh, at the end of the haircut, the, the barber asked her to reach in her, you know, asked her if she had a stamp card for the, for the salon. So my friend reached in her purse and pulled out the stamp card, except it wasn't the right card. She pulled out a, a business card for the jeweler. And on the back of the card, it said, Blue Topaz, <laughs> which is the name of the stone. So she never heard back from her jeweler but she found the information by accident when she went to the barbershop. So this is a, an example of how the, the situation where she's asked to reach in her purse is, uh, in the moment, she doesn't really understand why that's a meaningful opportunity. But shortly after, she realizes this answers a question that she was trying to, to find the answer to. So a synchronicity is a, a, an event that happens in the moment that you might not really understand why it's happening, 
And it could be a negative event like a, a car accident or an illness or something, that, an argument that you have with a, with a close family member or someone at work, but that it leads maybe to something in the future that is helpful for healing and growth. And it's about seeing the connection between what's happening in the moment that you don't have control over and how in the future it might actually benefit you. What comes to mind is that no one's doing that in the ways the unknown operating. Like you, in your book, you say, of the question you raise, you, the first question, I think, how do you get something out of nothing? And then you rephrase that, creating something out of everything. Well, how do we create something out of everything? So changing that idea. But I still, for some reason, it resonates with me, this uh, the idea of uh, being everything and nothing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there something that we could talk about for a moment, Skype? The emptiness and wholeness. How can we hold yeah. both ideas at the same time? They are they're so related. And I think this question of how do we get something out of nothing is a very common way of looking at the world. That's how we think about building a business or creating something new artistically. You know, we, we start from scratch, a blank piece of paper. How we, if we want to buy a house, we start from no money and we figure out how we're going to fill up our bank account. Or we think about how we need the latest device in our pocket in order to feel like we can do our, our work or feel complete. And what I suggest is that that is, is sort of a perspective of lack because we th we're thinking that without those things, who are we? Without filling up our schedule every day, what are we worth? And this comes from a fundamental worldview in science and also in religion that in the beginning there's the void. In, 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 in physics, it's the vacuum of space. And the whole question of physics is how do we understand why the vacuum is filled up with stuff? How did the Big Bang happen? But when you look at the world through this lens of the Fourier transform, you realize that these, this frequency and this spatial, the relationship between these two ways of looking at things is complementary. In other words, when one is full, the other is empty. And so to have an empty void is actually full of, um, well, in, in, the, in the frequency domain, it's full of uh, all sorts of information. Um, but to be less abstract, you know, for our listeners today, the idea is that um, we, we want to ask about the filters that we apply to the, the whole thing that we're dealing with. So you as a person are um, a whole being with many depths of emotions and thoughts and, and personality traits, many of which you probably don't even know about and some of which you consciously push away. And so when we look at ourselves as whole or our spouses as whole or our children or our parents or our coworkers as whole, we're less likely to react to the filters, the specific way that we're interpreting a situation and be more able to see what else is there underneath that might be unspoken. So wholeness is about, and emptiness also is about recognizing both what's visible and what's not visible and seeing them both as part of the whole. And then having practices to peel away the lenses that we're seeing the world through so we can see um, things that were previously not available to us. For instance, if, if someone offers us, you know, a chance to you know, take on a new project at work and we just don't feel like we're able to do it, we feel unconfident about it, we might have a filter that says, you know, I can't do that. But then we might have a part of ourselves that goes for it and says yes, and we learn about ourselves. Oh, I can handle this. And so we change our filters by having experiences which build our confidence or change our, our understanding uh, our, of our conditioning of the world. So talk to me for a moment about the connection between synchronicity, the way you explain and describe, and healing. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah. So I, in my book, I, I interviewed a, a, a colleague of mine who talks about she was living in India where she grew up and she was working for a company as a project manager, but she'd never worked with her own client before. She'd never been in charge of a project. And her manager came to her and said, I'd like you to take on this project. And my friend is a wonderful author, by the way, of uh, a book on intuition and um, em empathic listening. And she 
she's like, yes, I want to do this project, but she was nervous about it. And as it went, as the project went along, she didn't really have a lot of support from her supervisor and her personality, her filters were, uh, she, as she describes, were about people pleasing. So she found herself in a situation with this client, really trying to make them happy, but not able to find a balance there where she was constraining the project to be successful. And so in her words, it was a really unsuccessful project. You know, they weren't on time. The scope of the project grew because of her filters and the way she, she was relating to the client. But what she also learned was that all the things that she was afraid would happen when she failed, you know, she was afraid she, she'd get scolded. She was afraid she might lose her job. None of that happened. And she was very safe in that experience. You know, she grew from the experience. She learned about herself and she was part of a team that supported her. And that built confidence in her, that that synchronicity of that project coming along that she couldn't actually do, it reflected something to her about herself that helped her grow. And that confidence that she built from that experience to stand up for herself and to believe in herself, she accredits that to why she decided to uh, make the move internationally and come to the United States and start a career here and become an author. And all of her now successes, she, she looks back on that that difficult experience as a healing moment for her. Mm. Wow. So um, suffering, pain, and difficulties, challenges, they are actually a doorway to healing and to, wow, and to everything else. Joy, love, from my perspective, has been. Another a fascinating topic, I mean, you have so many topics in your book that I wrote here. Another one is self-compassion. You say, we are more powerful when we make mistakes and are compassionate. So talk to me about self-compassion as a concept and how it affects us in a profound way. It has been one of my practices, my best practices, I have to say. Yeah, mine too. And self-compassion is sort of in, in contrast to um, successfulness, right? right? Mm-hmm. These are different things. Yeah. Like, yeah. Especially when we're not successful is when right. we need to practice self-compassion. True. And what I've found is that being more compassionate with myself doesn't fix it when I fail, but it makes me 100% more able to grow quickly from the experience and turn whatever I perceived as a failure into sometimes a success, sometimes just like not that big of a deal, like in my friend's case, where she failed from the project, but she grew so much and she wasn't, she didn't actually take a step backwards at all. Um, So... uh, I think when we look at life through the perspective of healing and growth, then we we see these experiences as you know the most important thing we can do is learn to be more compassionate with ourselves. Because when we're compassionate with ourselves, we we grow much more quickly. We're more able to receive information because the filters of you know I'm not good enough, for instance, don't come up when, when we, we we stop listening to those filters. When we understand that filter that's there, and then we find other ways to frame it, then we can we can let in the learning aspects much more quickly. So one of the things I do in the workshops I lead is identifying the filters that we have. And if I have a filter that's like, I, I'm not good enough, that might be a really basic um, thought that I have. It might come with a feeling of um, uh, fear of trying something new, and it might come an insecurity. And it might come with a bodily sensation of tension in my chest or um, tightness in my throat. And so we identify the thoughts, the feelings, and the sensations that go with this experience and name that filter. I'm not good enough. But then we also look at, well, how could I change that filter a little bit? How could I change the wording to really give me some more freedom? So um, I'm not good enough yet is a very simple way to change a filter that lets in a different quality. So then... It's not about I'm not good enough and this is a judgment forever, but this is actually something I can learn here and I could actually maybe learn really quickly. So we can make small changes like that to our way of thinking that have a big impact on our the way we handle and experience life. One of the challenges for me when it comes to self-compassion and practices in general, it's trying to control the flow of thoughts that are attached to emotions. And I have been kind of study myself for a long time now. And I see that that the more I feel separated from life itself as a whole, in a sense of 
things being not just, we are separated in the sense of I'm here, you elsewhere in another state, another city, and everything seems like objects, including myself, the trees, everything. But then there is um, another perspective in my consciousness that can see or can sense, or I don't know the word for it. It can kind of sense the connectivity of it all. But I still don't know if we are able, if I can um, control thoughts and emotions when they arise. It's something like I've been um, experimenting now. And every time I feel separated from life itself, that's when it happens, thoughts to just take over the brain or the mind. Yeah, have you observed that before, Sky? Yeah, I think one, one of the ways in which we can tangibly understand how wholeness feels or what wholeness is, is by the way it feels when we feel connected in our lives. We feel connected to people in our in our personal sphere. We feel connected to our own power to make change. Like we feel confident in our in our uh, ability to handle our our work, our professional work, or we feel confident in our ability to ability to parent. So another way to look at the connection and disconnection is a confidence and insecurity. And you know the world is fundamentally uncertain. We're we're always going to be dealing with problems that emerge out of seemingly nowhere. But when we start paying attention to synchronicity, one of, one of the things that happens is we can start to see the context and not just the content. So when my friend my friend you know has this experience and fails at a task with her client, she can step back and say, okay, but what is the bigger context here? What am I trying to learn? And from this place of self-compassion, I can be open to how does this event actually serve something bigger than just my desire to be successful right now? And so then we don't have to take in the uncertainty of life in an insecure way. We can learn to become more confident with the unknown and our ability to navigate the unknown when we're more compassionate with ourselves. And I'll tell you from my experience, this does not, this does not mean that I am more successful all the time. It means I have more failures and more successes both. Right. I take on more things, yeah. I, I fail, pretty quickly sometimes and I learn from it quickly and right. and it's it's more of a, a pleasant process even when the, the, the learning can be difficult sometimes. Wow, I love that Sky, this message or insight about becoming more flexible and comfortable with the unknown. And I think that's part of wholeness because people right, if right. we just want to get it right, yes. then we're not actually honoring the parts of ourselves that don't know how to do stuff already and, and yeah. uh, need to learn. Yes, yes, a billion times. Yeah, it, it keeps coming back to me over and over again. Unconditional love is another way that I describe what you call wholeness. It's unconditional love. So this is the experience of the unknown. I have no idea what this is. And it's just magical and has to do with unconditional love, which for some reason uh, is very attractive to this here. The idea of love, that whatever's happening here is benevolent. It's trying, operating, or trying to flow in a way that's beneficial for all beings, for everything. I have no idea why this comes, but it comes that way, that it's benevolent. Well, that's why flow is such an important piece of this for me. You know, right, I study synchronicity right. from a scientific point of view, but then I look at, well, why is it important? It's important because I think when we start to act from in flow, we do things which um, not only serve us and our wholeness more, like we, we say no to certain projects that people want us to do, right? Saying no is a way of um, being whole because if it doesn't align with who we are, then saying no is, is defending our wholeness carving away what doesn't fit our, our our authentic self. That's why, you know, when we create something out of everything, what we're doing is carving away what doesn't fit to reveal what does remain. And uh, the, the, the great metaphor for that is a rainbow, because a rainbow is beautiful, right? It's got red, orange, yellow, green, blue. And, but those colors are actually portions of the white light that it was originally there. So, so the color you see is actually because you removed the other colors. And so what we can be doing is looking at ourselves as that, that white light and what are we going to remove in order to reveal what's inside of us? What kind of behaviors are we going to remove? I'm going to remove the part of me that's um, self-deprecating. 
when I remove that, uh, what emerges is just already there in my personality, the, the ebullient or enthusiastic parts of myself that are no longer held back by the self-deprecation. So choosing, um, creating out of, from creating something out of everything is about carving away what doesn't work for us. And I wonder why some of us are interested in this kind of exploration and some of us are not, not at all. Like my husband is not really interested in any of that, <laughs> any. So why do you think that is? Have you wondered? Well, I think everybody is, you know, some people might ask, you know, I'm not an emotional person. So how does this, what's the importance of talking about filters when, you know, I have thoughts, but I don't really have, I, do it. Does everybody have emotional filters? Does everybody, you know, decide what they can see or what they want, what they're okay with seeing, what they can perceive through these emotional filters? And I think everybody does have emotional filters. If you like uh, a certain type of movie, that's a that's an emotion. That's a feeling. Any preference you have is a feeling. And uh, if you have a preference for a certain type of movie, and your special someone suggests going to a different type of movie and your preference, your filter, your feeling about it makes you not willing or able to go to the other one because it's just not your thing. You might actually be missing out on something very important to live in flow and to be paying attention to synchronicity is to say, okay, I want to go see this one type of movie, but I'm being invited to do something totally different outside my comfort zone. If I go do that, I might go to the movie and find that there's some scene in that movie which speaks to me really deeply. And this is the synchronicity piece. Like, let's say I'm at work, I'm dealing with a, a difficult HR issue, or I've got to have a difficult conversation with someone. And I, But I go to this movie and I realize there's a scene about my very issue. And I learn something from that scene, from my personal experiences with my, you know, going to the movies with my family that applies and helps me out at work. Right. So synchronicity doesn't know any boundaries. It just mm. keeps sending you information from every direction in your life. And it's your job to mm. put together the context and learn from it. You just, you talked about, yeah, in the book, you talk about feelings and emotions. Is there a difference between feelings and emotions from your perspective, Sky? Well, Antonio Damasio uh, is, is studies this, uh, the feeling of what happens is, I think, the name of his book. And that influenced a lot of my earlier book called Living in Flow, The Science of Synchronicity and How Your Choices Shape Your World. Uh, and so feelings are a co our cognitive response to the emotions in our body. Our emotions are like thinking about that movie Inside Out by Pixar. The emotions that we run from, are, that, that run us are um, joy, fear, disgust, anger, and there's one other. And, and that model is you know, pretty interesting. But then the feelings we might have are based upon our, our, our cognitive interpretation of that. So I might feel like I'm going to go on stage and speak to a bunch of people. I might feel afraid, but I, if I feel afraid, it's because there's some message in my head that's like, I'm not good enough for this. I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm going to look bad. I'm not prepared. But I could also come at the same situation with the same emotion, the same, feel, the same uh, fear. But if I feel prepared and I feel confident, the thoughts are telling me something different. And my reaction might be excitement. So we might have one feeling, which is fear, but very different feelings about it based on our, our situation and our thought process. So in a way, feelings are natural and emotions are made up, <laughs> constructed by the mind and the filters that you speak of, values, belief systems. So it's the emotions that are, are natural in our bodies. We can't control them, but it's our feelings that are our interpretation that we can have some influence over. That's interesting. I ask this question often and I hear the opposite answer. <laughs> Always like, really? yeah, okay, different answers. It's very <laughs> interesting. In my head, just stayed feelings are natural and emotions are just created. But this, you say it's the opposite, the, the way. But it's the same thing, but, the way we're just yeah, using words to Yeah, describe. it's just words. It's really about how you internalize the knowledge. And uh, again, back to the, the work that we can do on ourselves is to understand how our thoughts and the inner experience we have also um, in our bodies relate to each other and and tell us a story about ourselves and when we can change that story to be more authentic to who we really are and our mm. wholeness that's when we experience change in life what is the best way to know sky from your perspective when we are being authentic how does it feel when we are in that space well mihai chiksentmihai wrote the book on flow that uh, many people refer to and 
Uh, so flow is this experience of timelessness or losing track of your sense of your own separate self. Um, I think that's also related to the experience of love. When people feel connected to another person, they feel a sense of love. I think part of what what love is, is a lessening of fear. So when, when we become more attuned to what we're feeling, we also become more aware when we're feeling fearful. And when we're not feeling fearful, there's this great relief. So I think we naturally feel whole. We naturally feel connected to life. And what gets in the way of that are the filters we have the conditioned way that we respond fearfully to different situations. You know, like say we're gonna be put on the spot with some information that we're actually an expert on, but we feel, you know, there's a filter that comes in the way of our expertise and says, you know, you're, you're not good enough to share this or you're gonna look silly or something. You know, when we let go of that fear, we experience wholeness. So the more we can identify what we're feeling and what's holding us back, those negative um, stories about ourselves, then we can experience uh, naturally, just this openness, the sense of comp confidence that comes from knowing ourselves wholly. Yeah, so it is the work of replacing belief systems in a way, telling different stories. Yeah, and, and I think our beliefs influence our synchronicities, right? The, when we when we believe something to be true, we take action in that direction. And that, that, influ that places apples on the tree ahead of us that make it more likely that we get to those points. So our beliefs are really in important in how we uh, create the synchronicities in our life. Yeah, I was about to ask you about if it is possible somehow to navigate this reality without any belief systems, no beliefs at all. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think I, I don't really think so. I, but I think what's really valuable right now, especially in history, at this time when we're dealing with these really big issues of systemic racism and injustice and um, climate change and political turmoil and, and people not listening well to each other, conspiracy theories. What we're dealing with is people who have opinions that are they're very firm with. Like, I think it's okay to have an opinion. It's, it's important to have an opinion. We all have opinions. We all have perspectives. Yeah. But I, I find that I'm often wrong in my perspective. <laughs> yeah. And this, this is where Tell being a parent, it. yeah, right? <laughs> Being a parent and being a husband is really helpful for me because <laughs> it shows me that I can be really clear about something and be totally hmm. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So hmm. I think it's good to have a perspective that you bring to the table, but then it's the openness to learn and to change that really defines how well we're going hmm. to work together on solving big issues or hmm. small issues. So true. What a beautiful message. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, important and beautiful and it resonates so true to me. Yes, being open, curious, uh, less judgmental and flexible, isn't it? It's all about yeah. adaptability as you is a word you use as the subtitle in your book. Adapt. Yeah, and, and yeah. synchronicities can be seen as anything that helps us learn more about ourselves and the world in a meaningful way. I do want to ask a question about misplaced grief and misplaced anger or could be the same what are they and talk to me for a moment about the gifts of grief well grief is something that most of us want to avoid yeah. we we try and navigate away from it whenever possible we don't want to talk about it a lot of times um, and what flow asks us to do is to go with the experience of the moment because through that experience but wherever our body is leading us is the next thing for us the next stepping stone so if we resist a certain experience because we don't want to feel that, we're not going to, we're going to possibly pull ourselves out of flow. And, you know, if I have a difficult relationship with my father, for instance, and I'm thinking about having a conversation with him about it, but I, I kind of avoid it because it brings up grief or difficult feelings. And then out of the blue, he calls to talk to my daughter, say his, his grandchild. And I've got a moment where I can say to him, hey, by the way, I wanted to talk to you. In that moment, in that synchronicity moment, I have a choice. And if I go, if I, if I allow my feelings to exist and I, I go with them and I try and work with them rather than pushing them away, I might take that opportunity to talk to him and have a really important conversation that opens the door for a, a, a new set of experiences in the future that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So when we can pay attention to the grief and what it's teaching us and where the resistance is in ourselves and open to that, oftentimes we can find great healing there and we're led to great healing. And so this is some of the work 
the the practices that I I teach in the Living and Flow workshop, where we we dive into the how synchronicity can bring us to a greater sense of wholeness in ourselves, and uh, and and then that when we embrace that, we get more of the experience of flow and get to the next stepping stone on our journey really easily. What do you think, or do you believe, or think that life as a whole has a purpose? And if you do, what would that be? What is the purpose of the human experience? <laughs> It's in the title of my book. <laughs> <laughs> to, to heal, grow, and adapt. Mm. <laughs> and to become okay. more whole. Mm. I think wholeness is this intangible thing. We can't really define what it really means, but that's part of what makes it what it is. When we can discover more who we are separate from the limiting filters, the limiting conditions that we place on ourselves based on our, on our history, then we can experience more uh, of the creative energy that we have, more of the authentic expression of ourselves. And from that, we can create step by step, just a little by little, a momentum towards a world that is more accepting of people and does not reject people, does not reject ideas, does not reject experiences, but embraces everything and everyone in its own unique, authentic way. And uh, I have two more questions for you. Would you like to add anything or read a passage from your book or in your book? Um, there, I would love to. I don't have one with me right now, but I, I'm going to read a quote from Aristotle that's in my book and um, invite people to go to my synchronicityinstitute.com website to find any information about current events. I do lead workshops on a regular basis that dive deeply into this kind of personal change around flow, synchronicity, and wholeness. And I have two books, Living in Flow and Leap to Wholeness. Um, there's a passage by Aristotle, and he says, anybody can be angry, that is easy. But to be angry at the right person, at the right time, in the right way, to the right degree, that is difficult. Not something everybody can do. And that speaks to wholeness because anger is a part of the human experience and it can be very transformative when it's used properly. When, when I direct my anger that I, that I have for someone at work to that person in a constructive way, it might solve a problem. If I hold a boundary with someone at the right time with the right person, that might solve a problem. But if I don't express my anger at work and I come home and my daughter asks me a question about her schoolwork and I get angry at her, I've expressed it at the wrong person. Then I create a wound in her that she holds on to. So that's how we perpetuate wounds by directing anger and, and negative emotions at the wrong people at the wrong time to the wrong degree. And so when we can, when we can gain control over that and, and be more of a master of ourselves, we can uh, create more healing with each step and less wounding with each step. I never thought it this way. I never read anything, but exactly this way. But it just makes so much sense to, to all my being. It's, it goes back to self-awareness, becoming, yeah, the flow that you speak of by being here, flowing with life itself. I like saying that I don't have a life. I am life. For some reason, it resonates with me, this idea that I don't have a life, I am life. Yes, beautiful. I would love to come back with talk with you more. I think there's so much more we could talk about. And I'm going to have to go take care of my family today. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sky. We'll be in touch soon, for sure. Yes, wonderful. I love your show. I love what you stand for. And I love your message, too. We'll talk soon. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Sky Nelson Isaacs and his work, please visit synchronicityinstitute.com and skynelson.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.